Good morning to those of you who have signed in a few minutes early for our virtual Chester Ronning Center event this morning. Um, or good day to you, I should say, if you're signing in from uh, somewhere out towards the East Coast or in another part of the world. Um, this morning we have part two of our uh, two two-part conversation with Sarah Hurwitz, A Jewish Journey in the White House. Um, we'll get started here in a few moments, but um, for those of you who weren't here last night or who may be new or newish to the Zoom platform, um, spend a few minutes, uh, if you don't mind, getting used to the features of the platform. And the main thing I want to point out, uh, as I pointed out last night as well, is the Q&A button. So either at the top of your Zoom window or perhaps at the bottom of your, your Zoom application window, you will find a, a little button that says Q&A. And uh, you can click on that button and submit questions uh, for Sarah at any time during the event. So we will have a, um, we'll have a, a period at the end where she will address those questions, but you can submit them at any time. So feel free to do that as she and I chat. Um, and of course, uh, at the end, you can submit questions as well. Um, we'll get started here in, in just a minute. Uh, as I said, we've, we've called this, this second part of our conversation, a coffee and conversation. It is mid-morning here in Alberta, so I hope you have a cup with you. I've got my uh, hand-crafted Augustana Vikings mug. Uh, go Vikings! Um, and as I said last night, I'll repeat again today also, uh, even if it's midday or afternoon where you're at, I hope you are enjoying a cup of coffee. If you're like me, you um, enjoy it. Uh, at any time of day. So, let's see. We're almost uh, right on time here, ready to go. Well, it's right at the top of the hour, so uh, we can go ahead and get started, I think. Um, for those of you just signing in, again, my name is Ian Wilson and I am director of the Chester Ronning Center for the Study of Religion and Public Life here at the University of Alberta. And I also teach religious studies at the uh, university's Augustana campus in Camrose. Um, and welcome again to part two of our conversation with Sarah Hurwitz, A Jewish Journey in the White House. As uh, I mentioned, and as many of you know, the Augustana campus is located in Camrose, Alberta, and uh, we'd like to acknowledge um, before our event today that the land on which we're gathering, or virtu virtually gathering, I'm, I'm here right now on campus, but I know many of you are not directly in the area, but the land on which we gather, traditionally known as Siniskau Sapisis, or Stony Creek, is in Treaty 6 territory and is a traditional meeting ground for many indigenous peoples. The land on which our campus is located provided a traveling route and home to the Musquachis, Nehiwak, Nitsitapi, Nakoda, and Sutina nations, the Métis and other indigenous peoples. Their spiritual and practical relationships to the land create a rich heritage for our learning and for our life as a community here. Again, my name is Ian, uh, there I am. Um, as you'll see in my brief bio there, um, my scholarly expertise, uh, my research expertise is actually the, the Hebrew Bible, um, the Jewish Tanakh, Christian Old Testament, and also the histories of ancient Israel and uh, the surrounding cultures in the ancient Near Eastern world. Um, so it's a real delight to be able to host uh, Sarah uh, this week. Um, and to talk with her, learn from her about her experience um, discovering, rediscovering Judaism during her time in the White House. Uh, before we get to our conversation with Sarah, just want to do one, one more plug for our various social media outlets, uh, the socials, as the cool kids call them. Um, you can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, and of course uh, on our website. If you are not already a part of our email list, please uh, visit the site and you'll find 
um, a link there to sign up for our email. And again, uh, I would like uh, to thank Kim Weeb. cannot thank her enough for all of her help with the logistics for these events and for handling the marketing and so on. Thanks so much, Kim. I appreciate it. So uh, if you didn't have a chance to meet Sarah Hurwitz last night, um, you will want to know that she uh, was a speechwriter in the Obama administration uh, for the entire Obama administration from 2009 to 2017, beginning as a uh, speechwriter for President Obama and then eventually becoming the chief speechwriter for the First Lady, Michelle Obama. Um, uh, as you'll see here, in addition to speech writing, she also worked on policy issues related to young women and girls as a senior advisor to the White House Council on Women and Girls. And just last year, she published a really excellent book, which I have a copy of here, which I plugged multiple times last night and will plug again today. Uh, it's called Here All Along, Finding Meaning, Spirituality, and a Deeper Connection to Life in Judaism after finally choosing to look there. Um, and last night in our conversation, we focused mainly on Sarah's time in Washington, her career there and how um, her, her Judaism and her, uh, her study of Judaism intersected with that career and with that life in Washington. Today, we're gonna talk a bit more about uh, Judaism in particular um, and um, some of the stuff that she talks about uh, in the book. So um, please join me in welcoming once again, Sarah Hurwitz to the Chester Ronning Center. And I will hey. stop my screen share here. Excellent. Hi, it's so great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks to all of you for joining us this morning. Yeah, hello again, Sarah. Thank you hello. for being with us. Um, of course. Yeah, uh, it's a beautiful day here. I hope it's here too as well. A little cold, but really quite nice. Yeah, yeah, and heading into Thanksgiving week there. So yeah, uh, yeah, good, good times. The holiday. <laughs> um, we had our Thanksgiving in October, so uh, that was but, wise. I'm just yeah. <laughs> you know. Yes. So. In any case, uh, thanks for being with us again. Um, We'll jump right into it, just like we did last night. And as I said, um, I have some questions prepared related mainly to topics you explore in the book and, and some of the specifics of, of Jewish uh, faith and practice. Um, and then we'll have time at the end for questions. So just another reminder for the audience, you can use that Q&A button to submit questions at any time. Um, so not to start off on a dour note, but uh, right, it probably goes without saying, um, <laughs> at this point that these are tough times. Um, we're living in an incredibly challenging moment. Um, there's the pandemic, there's been unrest and protest with regard to economic, environmental, racial injustices in our society. Um, there's the Trump administration, um, which as we talked about some last night is on its way out, but uh, the transition is looking like it's not going to be super smooth. So I could go on, but I'll stop there um, because we all know what 2020 has been like. So what do you think is the most important insight that Judaism has to offer us at this time? And, and I would ask that question both um, to you, both from the perspective of someone inside the community um, but also to perhaps give some insights for those who aren't um, Jewish or don't have connections to the Jewish community. So what kinds of hopes and challenges does Judaism offer all of us in these tough times? Yeah, you know, I think what I believe is the core defining Jewish idea is this belief that we're all created in the image of God. And that's actually a verse from the core sacred Jewish text, the Torah, which is the first five books of what Christians call the Old Testament and Jews call the Tanakh. So this is a verse that says that, you know, God created people in God's image. And, you know, you don't have to believe in any kind of God to understand the power of that. You can be a total atheist. It's actually not a, there's no deity required to understand what this means. You know, in Jewish tradition, this is understood to mean, as a rabbi named Yitz Greenberg beautifully puts it, it's understood to mean that every single human being is infinitely worthy. You know, you can't put a price on a human life. We're all completely equal. There's none, nobody is more valuable or important than anyone else. And we're each fundamentally unique. 
There is no one else on this planet like us. Now you can say, well, of course we all believe that. I mean, those are pretty obvious points, but that's not true. You know, there's not a single person on this Zoom, including me, who actually really deep in our hearts believes that. You know, I, I think about just personally, the number of times I've walked by someone on the street who said to me, hey, can you spare a dollar? And I've either said, oh, okay. And I've given the person a dollar and walked on, or I've said, oh, you know, I'm sorry, sir, not today. I don't have my wallet with me. And I, I've kept going. If that person had been a celebrity, if that person had been someone I'd seen on TV, would I really just have sort of politely stopped and then moved on? No, I would have been excited. I would have wanted to meet them. So why is that? Well, it's because I, like I think most people, value people differently based on their status, their wealth, their beauty, their fame. You know, we do rank people differently according to these things, but I think the core animating Jewish idea is that no, actually every human being has equal dignity and worth and value just by virtue of being human. And you know, I think that is something that has very much gotten lost in, in especially in recent years. I mean, I think it's something we've always struggled with as human beings, but I, I see it especially in my country in recent years when, you know, from the very top, of our government, we have a you know a person in office who is just consistently degrading and undermining that core universal moral idea. You know, saying that certain people are criminals and animals, and sowing all of this hatred and fear and it just you know and disdain for the others, and it's very very dangerous. So I think really stepping back and just keeping our eyes and our hearts on that core animating idea, which is you know this is how Judaism articulates it. But I actually think. You know, from, from what I know, pretty much all faith traditions have some notion along those lines. And I think decent secular people do as well. So I think that just kind of reminding ourselves of that and trying to keep that core in the image idea in mind would be particularly helpful at this time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so thinking along those lines about um, a kind of Jewish understanding of humanity, that we're all created in uh, the image of God, um, that, of course, leads to the question of uh, what is God? <laughs> what is that image, right? Um, so I certainly agree um, that, uh, yeah, it should be, I mean, it is in many religious traditions a fundamental principle, and it should be something that we all uh, uh, follow in this idea that we're all kind of on an even playing field. But that phrase, of course, also ex compares us to God. Um, so... Um, when I teach uh, Judaism in my introduction to religion class, many of my students find it shocking that there are large numbers of Jews in North America that don't actually believe in God or um, are perhaps thoroughly agnostic about it, right? Or, or just, you know, um, satisfied about their agnosticism <laughs> with that regard. Um, so, um, could you talk some about the other end of that equation, right? What, what is it, how, how do different Jewish communities um, talk about God? And what does that concept or that word mean for you as an individual? So I know this is a huge question. Yeah, so, no, 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 it's, it's okay. You know, however you like, but there's lots of different things, you know, right? Um, if we're thinking about being made in the image of God, maybe what are some, some standard Jewish uh, views on the question of who is God or what is God? And then also what are, what are your own personal convictions about that? Yeah. And I can, I can understand why your students might be a little bit confused because I think that, you know, Christianity is such a dominant religion in, in, in at least in the U S. Um, and so I, and, and, you know, Christianity is a religion where faith is quite central. You know, if you say, Oh, I'm a Christian, but you know what? I no longer believe in God, nor do I believe that Jesus was the son of God it's sort of hard to argue that you're still a Christian at that point, right? The, the kind of core of the belief has now disappeared for you. So I, you can certainly have Christian values or be part of a Christian community, but are you really a Christian? I think it's hard to argue that you are. Whereas with Judaism, you know, Judaism is not just a religion. It is actually a peoplehood. You know, I'm Jewish because my parents are Jewish. I was born into Judaism, or you can become Jewish by converting to Judaism. So I can reject every single tenet of Jewish religion and I'm still Jewish. I'm still part of the peoplehood. And that is very confusing for people. You know, in terms of Jewish understandings of God, you know, I, I talked a little bit about this last night, and I, you know, what I think moves me most is there's a real theological humility in Judaism, where we actually don't really have one creed or definition of God that you must either accept or reject, because I think we tend to feel that we're talking about something so beyond what our tiny human brains can possibly, you know, reduce to some 
sort of rigid category. You know, to, to do that is almost to be practicing idolatry, to be sort of shrinking the divine to the size of the human. And we really, you know, idolatry, big no-no in Judaism. So you know, what you have are just this real diversity of conceptions over a period of centuries where various thinkers and theologians are articulating concepts of God based on their own lived experience and their own understanding of Jewish tradition. So you have Jewish mystics who say that everything is God. You know, you all are God, I am God. The idea that there's any barrier between us, that's an illusion. So that man I passed on the street who asked me for help, that man is actually God. He's, that man is an expression of God. And, you know, when you actually, if you can just for like a minute, for a second, just kind of slip into this way of thinking, it's actually quite profound, right? It's, it's a very, and you can't really live your life there, but just that, that, that kind of understanding that we're all one, we're all connected, quite powerful. You know, there's a Jewish thinker named Martin Buber, who's been quite influential, not just in the Jewish world, but in many faith traditions and secular traditions. He says that God is, he said that God is what arises between two people in just profound human relation to each other. Two people being fully vulnerable to each other, fully seeing each other. Uh, in that moment of just deep connection, what arises between them is God. There's a thinker named Mordecai Kaplan who says that God is the process by which we each become our highest and truest selves. So the process that leads you know, a seed to develop into a plant that leads a, you know, a dishonest person to become more honest. That sort of actualizing growth, growth process is God. So, you know, and that's, those are just three of many, many ideas of God in Jewish tradition. You know, in terms of my own conception, I think I have, I have a conception that's quite Jewish in that it's very contradictory and kind of embraces many, many different approaches. You know, if you look at ancient rabbis who are kind of really set the foundation of Jewish law, they just in one breath, we're saying God is just radically transcendent, beyond all time, space, human imagination. And in the next step, it was like, oh, God's kind of this, you know, person who's here in the world with us, available for relation. You know, God is like a father. It's like, wait, wait, wait a second. You just, you just said two things that can't both be true, but that didn't bother them, right? They, they understood that neither of those things was a complete idea of God, but was just them gesturing at God, them imagining God. You know, these are all, I don't think any of us can know what the divine is, all we can do is come up with these human constructs that just allow us to maybe feel some sense of the divine, to, to conceptualize it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So when I think about the concepts that most resonate for me, you know, I do think that everything is God. I like that mystical idea. I do think God is a, a actualizing force that, that sort of calls me to my highest purpose. I think that God is what arises between two people in deep relation. Like I, I've really felt that. Um, at the same time, I relate to God as a you. Now, that doesn't make any sense, right? God can't both be a force and everything and also a you, which connotes a being. I don't really care. That's okay. You know, I, I think that I'm basically saying, I don't know what this is. And here are the numerous ways that I conceive of and relate to it. You know, I relate to the divine as a you because I, you know, my human heart can't relate to a force. I think if you were able to ask a tree its conception of the divine, it would use a very different language because it's a tree, right? This is the language of human relation and that's the language that I choose to use. Um, and, but I think a more interesting question than like, what is God is sort of like, when do you feel the divine? Like that I actually think is sort of a more helpful question for me. And, you know, I do feel it in moments of profound relation. I feel it in nature. I feel it when I just witness acts of incredible self-transcendence or self-sacrifice. You know, those strike me as as somehow just like a, a sort of almost divine form of love. You know, I think about, you know, early on, I remember at one point in the White House, um, a colleague of mine was writing a speech for the Medal of Honor, where every so often the president will give, award the Medal of Honor to a member of the United States military who's just committed an act of just breathtaking heroism and sacrifice. And this is often presented posthumously because these people often don't survive, they sacrifice their life. Um, and I remember talking to, and, and it's, these speeches are very hard to write because the scenarios, you know, the ways in which these people made the sacrifice, it's very complicated, right? The fog of war, it's sort of, you're describing and then this happened and then these people ran here and the enemy this, and it, they're just very hard to articulate clearly. So I remember just checking in on him and saying, you know, how's the speech going? Have you figured out how to describe what happened concisely? And he just said to me, you're not going to believe this, but this year, like the story is really basically one sentence long. It's like, really? What, what's the story? And he said, you know, soldier jumped on a grenade to save his colleagues and happened to just miraculously live. Hmm. This whole story. Um, and when he actually, obviously he was very, very badly injured, as one can imagine. Uh, his colleagues were not were saved, which is extraordinary. And when he woke up, like the first words out of his mouth were like, I'm going to die. It was just this terror where he just absolutely knew you know, this was not some 
sort of mindless impulse. This was a deliberate calculated decision he had made to sacrifice his life for others. You know, hearing that story, I just thought like that to me, you know, I, I sense the divine in that. Um, you know, is this scientific? Can I prove this all in a court of law? No, I can't. But I don't know. Can you prove why you love your spouse in a court of law? I, mean, I can probably find you many other people who look like your spouse, have the same resume, have the same personality. You know, again, there's something sort of in it, you know, mysterious and inexplicable about love and about faith. I don't think that makes them any less real. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a couple of things come to mind uh, listening to your description of the many different ways to understand the divine and, and also your kind of spiritual connections with that. One is the, the, the old saying that wherever two Jews are gathered, you'll find at least three opinions. <laughs> yes, exactly. That is very true. <laughs> Which I think very much sums up the kind of diversity of options that are available within Jewish tradition. Um, Absolutely. To, to and by God. the way, something else I should have said is I don't believe that there is an all-powerful God who can intervene in human affairs. I just, I, have, I don't believe that. Um, you know, I, I really struggle with any conception of the divine that involves a lot of mental gymnastics and kind of rationalizing and explanations. And, you know, that I find really, I find a real struggle. And I, I see people struggling with these very, very difficult theologies that are hard to sustain. So for me, you know, that's a theology that I can't sustain. You know, if there is a God who's truly in charge of everything, either by act or omission, I'm not interested in worshiping that God. If that that is that is not a you know looking at the world today I'm I'm not interested in that and I just can't morally tolerate that idea so I you know I think of a God that is you know all knowing that is all good but not one that can actually intervene in my life to control anything so I think of it as more there's more of an awareness of something bigger that somehow accompanies us but you know I don't think can actually intervene in our lives. And uh, as you talk about in the book, that's, that's a position that's perfectly sustainable within Jewish tradition, which Absolutely. is another thing that often my students find shocking, right? I when, know. When they hear it. <laughs> no. and to be fair, because most, you know, most folks in North America generally, but uh, also most folks in our, in our area and who come to, to our campus um, grew up, uh, if not within a particular Christian tradition, at least very familiar with it since it's the dominant um, the dominant religious tradition for the most part in, in North America. Um, and so it's some of these concepts of theology and divinity are, are quite different than what you would find in, um, in many mainstream Christian denominations. Um, another thing that came to mind um, is, well, it sounds like, um, right, you, you're, you're open to uh, embracing a number of different positions about divinity, but also that you... Um, you have a kind of spiritual connection for lack of a better way to put it, or, or you, you recognize moments of spiritual connection with, uh, with God. Um, so a common phrase we hear these days um, from, from uh, Jewish individuals, but also from lots of different folks is I'm spiritual, but not religious, um, which is something we, we talk about in my classes. Many of my students see themselves that way. Um, it's interesting though, because one of the kind of stereotypes or perhaps even cliches about Judaism is, well, you can be religious, but not spiritual, right? You could be a kind of cultural Jew or, you know, you go to the, the high holiday celebrations or so on, um, but you may not believe in any of it, so to speak, right? Um, so that's a kind of stereotype, I think, uh, uh, of Judaism, at least in, in some North American contexts. Um, but we have seen in recent years this kind of increase of an identification with being spiritual but not religious. So how does that work out in Judaism? What, what do you think of this, this common descriptor of I'm spiritual but not religious? And, and how do you, what do you think Judaism has to say about that? You know, speaking just personally for myself, you know, not, not necessarily, like, you know, in terms of what Judaism has to say about it, that's sort of, I'm not sure I could totally answer that, but just speaking personally, you know, I don't love it. I have to be honest. I kind of am spiritual, but not religious. Um, what I often find, and look, there are certainly ways that one can feel that way and be that way that are beautiful and, and lovely. And I, you know, I don't want to paint with a broad brush, but I, I find that oftentimes people who say this haven't necessarily actually taken the time to explore any established ancient faith tradition and really see what it has to offer, or they've come into contact with a really horrific version of it and have just said, oh, all religion is awful. And you know, I'm sympathetic to that. A lot of religion is horrible. 
a lot of, you know, you, you actually, you do see, unfortunately, some very distorted forms of religion. That, that's quite unfortunate, but those aren't the whole, right? Those shouldn't be taken to, under, to represent religion. I would also say a lot of religion is extraordinary. It is deep and wise and crowdsourced by millions, if not billions of people over thousands of years and contains extraordinary wisdom about the human condition. And, you know, judging all of religion by the kind of extremist, hateful, bigoted, distorted, cruel versions, that's a mistake, right? It's a mistake to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So I, I just, my patience for that is a little thin because I often think it's people who are dismissing religion as it's all oppressive and bad and haven't actually ex explored the really radical, deep, intellectual, wise versions of it that are quite powerful. I also have hesitations about it because oftentimes when I, you know, I sort of see these people and the way they are spiritual is like, oh, I do this spiritual thing and that spiritual thing and this is so me and that's so me and like, oh, I've just found all these things that are so me and that's fine. But again, like at some point you're kind of deifying yourself, right? It's a religion of self. It's like, oh, here are all my preferences. And I've found things that make me, you know, that sort of affirm my, my preferences, which is how we, a lot of us, me included, consume social media and media today, right? I look at the social media and media that confirm my biases, my preferences, and it kind of makes me narrower and narrower minded and more and more self-righteous. Um, you know, I think the, the power of these ancient religions is that they are complete systems designed not just to affirm everything you think, but to challenge you to say, oh, you know what, H how much of your income did you give to the poor? And you know what, were you really there for that person who was struggling? And, you know, how are you using your speech? Did you just, did you just, you know, gossip or shame someone in a way that really harmed them? And, you know, are you being a good community member? And, you know, oftentimes when I've sort of contemplating those questions in Judaism, I've found that I've come up wanting. You know, I found like, oh boy, Judaism's kind of calling me on my my selfishness, my my laziness sometimes, my anger, my greed. And you know, that's not to say that I should accept everything in these ancient traditions. I think it's important to fight, you know, to push back, to debate, to challenge, to explore that no one should be a blind believer. I mean that's for sure. But you know, to dismiss all of the wisdom that these traditions have, I think is a big mistake. And to kind of declare ourselves the kind of deity and we kind of plan everything around ourselves, I, th I think you can end up missing things. I mean, that's at least my experience. Like I am not, you know, some people might be these morally superior beings who don't need that. I do, right? I, I should not be deciding these things for myself. And I think it's very helpful for me to have a tradition and to find practitioners of it who I trust. I think that's the number one thing. It is finding religious leaders and communities where the leaders have as much of an intellectual background as they have religious training. I think that's very important. You know, I, personally, if, if my clergy are not, you know, in favor of gay marriage, if they are not protesting injustice, then I'm, I'm out, right? That, I'm, not, I'm not interested in that. Like I, I want to make sure they have, you know, they really do act on their religion, you know, the core Jewish idea that everyone is truly created in the image of the divine. And if I, if they're not, then we have a problem. So I, you know, I think that, I think that just dismissing what these ancient traditions offer, I think it's unfortunate. Yeah, uh, yeah. As you've said, the the, the Jewish tradition, um, many other um, religious traditions are very rich, very complicated, uh, way more in depth than many people realize. <laughs> way more. Every tradition has a deep, intellectual, you know, profound tradition that is practiced and led by really excellent human beings who are moral exemplars. Mm -hmm. And it's about finding that that aspect of the tradition, right? And it's about avoiding. The distorted aspects of it yeah. that tend to be very loud and get all the attention but you know, i was last night on a website for the san francisco night ministry where it is people of all different faith backgrounds like every possible faith background who are just answering a hotline late at night for people who are really struggling and they're not there to proselytize or talk about god or whatever they're there because a human being is in need and they are a human being and they are speaking to connect and to help them i thought like wow this will never make the headlines. This will never go viral on social media, but this is like the best of these religious traditions, and I, I wish it got more attention. Yeah, yeah, and we talked about this some last night, but um, right, the 
the religion box, so to speak, is a big one and you can put lots of different things in it. And so yes. last night, someone asked the question about religion in the White House and well, religion has always been in the White House. <laughs> but how, how, how the folks in the White House have filled that, that religion box, so to speak, has differed from administration to administration. Um, so yes, I think quite a bit. Yeah, uh, I, I certainly agree with you. We should look for those uh, those communities, those groups that that fill the box um, in ways that are are just and right. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So um, again, we talked about this some um, last night, but I think it's worth um, bringing up again. Um, when we think of Jewish worship and prayer. Um, we often think of uh, kind of packed synagogues for high holiday services or for um, bat or bar mitzvahs. Um, obviously, right now in these difficult times, it's, it's not possible, it's not safe uh, for communities to gather in large numbers in closed spaces like that. Um, so how are, how are Jewish communities dealing with this challenge right now? And I know you, you shared a couple of really great examples last night. Um, as I said earlier, there, there may be some new folks, so feel free to share those examples again, or if you have other stories too about um, how, how Jewish um, individuals, but especially communities who are really lacking in or not able to have communal worship and prayer and, and celebration right now, how, how are they handling that? So a lot has moved online. I've been to a Zoom bar mitzvah and a Zoom bat mitzvah, the bars for a boy, bars for a girl, and they were beautiful. You know, not as nowhere near as good as in person, let's be clear, but quite moving. I've, I've been to a Zoom shiva, which is the basically the seven days of mourning after someone has lost a loved one, where every day people traditionally would come to the house of the mourners just to sit with them, pray with them, just be present with them. I did that on Zoom right, to just be present with a friend who had just lost her father. Again, not the same, but we are moving things online. I also think it's just important to understand that while, you know, while sort of communal prayer and gathering in a synagogue, it is very much a central form of Jewish prayer. You know, Jewish prayer tends to be quite communal. Our liturgy is largely in the we voice, not the I voice. But, you know, there is a, there are really rich Jewish uh, spiritual techniques that are outside of communal prayer. So you have, you know, unscripted personal prayer is very much a native Jewish form of, of worship. You know, if you look into the Bible, you know, our, you know the Jewish char the characters in the Bible, when they wanted to talk to God, they didn't break out a prayer book and start reading it. You know, they just talked directly to God. That's a native form of Jewish prayer. And there's actually a centuries old uh, Jewish prayer technique that I really like called Hit Boredut, uh, which involves going out into nature, somewhere where you cannot be heard, somewhere secluded, and just speaking out loud to God. And if you don't believe in God, that's fine. You just say, I don't believe in you. I'm talking to nothing. This is stupid. Um, it has to be out loud, not in your head, and you can't pause. So if you run out of things to say, you just say, run out of things to say, run out of things to say, this is stupid. You just keep talking. And you know, I've, I've tried that practice on a number of Jewish silent meditation retreats, and it's quite powerful. Uh, it can also be done in your home if you don't have access to nature. In a quiet room, you can whisper, but it's a pretty powerful practice. There's also a very well-developed thousand-year-old, thousands-year-old Jewish practice of blessings, where there's a series of, of scripted blessings that you just say as you go about your day. So before you eat a meal, you say a blessing of gratitude for it. You know, actually, after you go to the bathroom, there's a blessing where you say a blessing of gratitude for the fact that your body is functioning properly. If you see a rainbow, there's a blessing. If you see, you know, seeing the ocean, there's a blessing. And this is really a, a practice that is kind of pushing you to just have moments of gratitude and awe and wonder throughout your day, to not just kind of sleepwalk through your life, but to actually pause and say, you know, I have food. This is something that many people in the world don't like. I, I really need to appreciate this. You know, to pause and say, like, I am, I am healthy. How many people would kill for that right now? Right? We're in a time of pandemic, so I think that's a great practice. Study is traditionally thought of as a Jewish form of worship. Like studying our ancient texts, it's not just an academic exercise. It's very much about sort of looking at the wisdom of your ancestors for how to live your life. And I actually find studying to be, for me, is a very profound spiritual practice. That's a very important one to me. And finally, there's a well-developed Jewish practice of meditation that stretches back thousands of years. So again, there are all these different kind of techniques and, and, and spiritual tools that I think we have at our disposal, many of which can just be done you know, individually or with our families, and lots of which can be done online. Um, I've now attended two week-long silent Jewish meditation retreats online in, from my apartment 
by Zoom and I'm used to doing them in person, but I have to say they worked really well online. Who would have known? So we're getting creative, which is good. Yeah, yeah. Just like these these events. Uh, exactly. That we're, that we're, running, <laughs> we're figuring out ways to do them. Um, right. Two, two of my favorite parts of the book, one was when in the chapter on prayer, when you talk about the first time you went uh, and did the practice of what I do at this retreat um, and how you just really struggled with it. Um, and, and the, the, your story of coming to terms with it in the book is really great. Uh, another thing you point out that you mentioned a moment ago is uh, prayers of gratitude. And, you know, we talked some about the spiritual but not religious movement and how kind of gratitude and mindfulness and, and some of these things that are very hip nowadays um, and trendy have been around in Judaism and in other religious traditions, but uh, uh, in Judaism in particular for thousands of years. And there is a very rich, deep tradition of um, specific ways to to acknowledge gratitude, to pray gratitude. Um, and so uh, in the book, uh, yeah, that, that really stuck out to me too, to, to point out that these things have been around for a long time. <laughs> they're not just recent helps, self-help trends. They're, they're, they're things that human beings have, have been striving towards and working on for a really long time. Um, so I want to at least ask you one question about uh, politics. We, we covered sure. politics some yesterday, but um, we'll cover it a bit today. I have, I have one question here in mind. Um, of course, you work in politics. You, you've worked your life in public service. Um, and you've talked quite a bit to us today and yesterday about how Judaism has impacted that life and work. Um, some folks, though, um, both within the Jewish uh, world, but also in other religious traditions um, and outside of those traditions might say that that religion and politics shouldn't mix. Um, Judaism and politics shouldn't mix. Rabbis shouldn't be talking about politics, shouldn't be encouraging their congregations to worry about political matters or whatever. Um, what do you think about that as someone who has worked in politics and who also is quite learned in terms of Judaism? How would you answer that or how would you respond to that critique? Yeah, so I'll start by saying that I'm a very big, very big believer in the American constitutional idea of the separation of church and state. Um, when those things get conflated, it does not go well for minority religions, nor for majority religions, actually. It's really, I, I'm a big fan of separating church and state, no prayers in schools, things like that, big fan. However, when it comes to the sort of idea that, oh, rabbis shouldn't talk about politics in the synagogue or Jewish organizations shouldn't get involved in politics. That one I'm, I'm less fond of because I think that it, it fundamentally um, kind of, it almost seems like people who say that haven't really read the Torah in any kind of deep way because, you know, when I look at the Torah, it's a very political document. I mean, you can really read it almost as a political polemic against a lot of the norms and values of the ancient Near Eastern world. So, you know, this is basically a story about a God who rescues this group of Israelites, these helpless slaves in Egypt, you know, frees them, assembles them at a base of, of a mountain, Mount Sinai, and gives them a mission. And the mission this God gives them is essentially, this God tells them, your mission is to build a society that is the exact opposite of Egypt, a society that upends all of the old power structures of the ancient Near East, a society that doesn't worship kings or emperors or pharaohs, but that is most concerned with the needs of the most vulnerable, the widow, the orphan, the stranger, the poor you know, which is a very weird thing for an ancient Near Eastern God to be telling people. That was not generally what ancient, ancient Near Eastern gods tend to really like emperors and pharaohs. And this God is just really in to the weakest, most vulnerable people. And so, you know, I think that that's a very, it's quite a political charge. They're right, that's about power structures. And this God is also incredibly preoccupied with income inequality. You know, there are a number of parts of the Bible where this God is, you know, dictating specific ways to remedy income inequality that develops over time. This God is incredibly concerned with poverty. This God is very worried about the rights of immigrants. You know, no fewer than 36 times in the Torah, it says, love the stranger for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Who is the stranger? It's the non-Israelite, right? It's the non-insider. It is the outsider. Well, that, that's the immigrant, right? That, that's pretty, pretty clear. So, you know, the Torah is, is quite a political document. That being said, you know, I certainly don't think that you can say, well, the Jewish position on immigration is X, or the Jewish position on healthcare is Y, right? Jewish law is quite complicated and you can muster Jewish law to support a variety of positions. I think some of those arguments are better than others, but I don't think you can say there is one unilateral voice in Judaism. There isn't, it's a very diverse, 
deep religion. Um, and I certainly don't think that you know we should be partisan, right? It shouldn't be about picking a political party or anything like that. But you know, to not be political, to sort of not talk about these core issues that are so central in the Torah, our core sacred texts, um, I just think it's kind of missing out on the beating heart of the tradition. I think it has to be done well. I, I certainly don't think that people should be shamed for you know what they believe or don't believe. But you know, I recently encountered a rabbi who said was very proud. He said to me, you know, "I'm so proud. None of my congregants know who I voted for in this election." And you know, if it had been 2000 or 2004 or 2008 or 2012, I would have said, "Good for you. Good for you. Like that's great." Because in those elections, both candidates were perfectly reasonable candidates, right? Like you know, th those were policy differences that they had. And, you know, I feel strongly about my side, but I don't think that people who voted for John McCain are like wildly immoral. I think they have different we have policy differences. I have many friends from the Bush administration. They're great people. We have policy differences. To not have your congregation not know who you're voting for in 2020 is deeply troubling to me because this has nothing to do with policy differences mm -hmm. and everything to do with differences on just fundamental moral values about cruelty versus kindness, corruption versus integrity, you know, like compassion versus brutality. I mean, these are very, very basic values. And when it comes to those basic values, Judaism is actually quite unambiguous. It's actually quite clear. And when it comes to malicious lying, corruption, cruelty, and abuse of the vulnerable, Jewish, there is no dissent in Jewish law. It's very clear what the position is, which is no. We are, we are highly passionately against those things. So I actually think this time around, you know, just saying, well, I'm going to just step away from politics. You know, I, I really think you're making a moral decision that is, is quite dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. How does, I want to ask a follow-up question about reading Torah and knowing some of that historical context, which you're, you're spot on. You know, that, that's, that's one area that I, I actually know quite a bit about. And, and reading your book, I was like, oh, right on. She's, she's got this. This is great. Um, but for example, the, 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 the instance you... Um, brought up last night about eye for an eye, right? So the, the Torah, this sounds very terrible. And of course, later on, the rabbis qualify it in X number of ways. Right. Um, but uh, this idea that this kind of law would apply to everyone, regardless of social status or class or gender yes. or whatever, was a novel idea in the ancient Near Eastern world, um, where in right. other law codes that we know from, from that part of the world um, in antiquity, um, would say, well, you know, if you hurt this kind of person, yeah, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, so on. Um, but if it happens to a slave, well, then you just got to pay the owner some money to make up for it, right? And so uh, in, in other legal contexts in the ancient world, it's very clearly um, uh, classified by status, by class, by gender. Um, right. So in any case, all that is just a background to say um, how in, in a typical synagogue setting or in a typical Jewish community, um, how do folks ensure that that some of that historical context is known, that interpretation is done in such a way um, that those differences that are really important for understanding Judaism as a political, you know, as fundamentally political in the Torah. Um, I, I'm have struggling to formulate my question here because this is all off the cuff, but um, <laughs> you, you get what I'm asking? Yeah, no, I totally get what you're asking. And I think the importance yeah. of history and, and understanding yeah. the original context of these texts. Totally. I mean, I think the, reverting to a kind of originalism. Right. Says, must do this the way it was done in 500 yes. CE or whatever. No, exactly. I mean, that's exactly right. You know, I, I, I sometimes really get frustrated with Jews I know who are very disengaged who say, well, you know, I read the Torah and I just, ugh, I just can't. Any religion believes in that, I can't do it. And it's like, that is just such an ignorant thing to say. The Torah is a 2,500 year old document that we have spent 2,500 years reimagining, right? And look, sure, it was really progressive for its time 2,500 years ago. Yeah, so, you know, yeah. it didn't outlaw slavery, but it certainly undermined slavery to the extent, to the point where it was pretty clear that slavery was not going to be sustainable. I mean, there's so many restrictions and rules and, you know, your slave has to rest on Shabbat, the Jewish Sabbath, just like you do. Well, okay, once you're saying my slave is entitled to the same rights that I am, it, it's, it becomes increasingly hard to justify slavery. So there's a lot of things like that. You know, people, I think both Jews and both people who are not Jewish need to understand that Judaism is an interpretive religion. So we've spent 2,500 years reinterpreting this ancient document 
to ensure that it reflects the moral sensibilities, our evolving moral understandings and sensibilities. You know, 2,500 years ago, slavery was widespread and common. It became very clear over centuries that that was a moral abomination. So it was outlawed, right? There, there are many things that were, you know, that have just been interpreted and reinterpreted. I mean, certainly 2,500 years ago, no one thought that women would be rabbis, right? No one thought that, you know, 90% of American Jewish communities would be ordaining gay rabbis and performing gay marriages, right? That's not, not really clear from the original text of the Torah, but we've kind of kept up that interpretive tradition. And I think it's really important to communicate to Jews and non-Jews, yes, the Torah is the kind of founding text, but it's not, you know, it's not meant to be read literally. It's meant to be interpreted. And our interpretation, you know, all the commentaries that have come after the Torah are equally important, you know, are, are how we understand the Torah. It's very similar with the U.S. Constitution. You know, we don't have slavery anymore in the United States, thank God. But the original draft of our, con the original version of our Constitution quite clearly permitted slavery, mm -hmm. you know, and thankfully we have reinterpreted it. Similar process in Judaism. Yeah, yeah. And we have 200 plus years of case law in the U.S. too, right? To help, exactly. help elaborate, to help set precedents and so on. And it's similar in Jewish tradition. Um, right. uh, so um, we have a little bit of time here, a few minutes before we want to jump into some audience questions. So maybe the last question I'll ask is um, another <laughs> kind of big open-ended tough one. But, uh, but what do you think is the biggest challenge that the Jewish community in North America faces today? Uh. Yeah, I mean, I really think probably our biggest challenge is just a lack of literacy. You know, this is such a deep, vast, complicated tradition. And I think that a lot of us, you know, a lot of North American Jews, we, you know, go to Hebrew school as kids, we have our bar bat mitzvah, and then we stop learning. It's like, oh, okay, good, I did it. And age 13 is just when you're ready to start really appreciating the, the deep, wise, inspiring, radical, you know, complicated offerings that Judaism has to provide. But unfortunately, it's when we kind of tend to stop learning. Mm -hmm. And so what you have a situation is then, you know, 20 years later, we have kids and we're like, uh-oh, someone's got to make this kid Jewish. Not me. I don't know enough to do that. I'll have a Hebrew school teacher do it and they'll have to do it in two hours a week. And then that kid gets the Hebrew school education, has the bat mitzvah and is out. Yeah, it's sort of this cycle. And you know, Judaism is something that's hard to appreciate if you really don't understand it well. You know, there are very few things where we stop learning at age 13. You know, if someone came up to you and said, oh, you know, I, I just stopped studying science at age 13. You know, I, I stopped studying history at age 13. I, I felt like I knew enough. You know, you would think, well, gosh, I don't, can you really, you know, you don't really have an under, adult understanding of that. And so I think that lack of literacy, it really needs to be remedied. And I think that's especially the case in the U.S., which has such a strong assimilationist tradition. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we've oftentimes in the U.S. Jewish community, we've kind of leaned into this, the peoplehood idea of Judaism, which is important. We are a peoplehood. Judaism is not just a religion. But peoplehoods in America don't last very long. If you think back to 150 years ago, it was very important to be Irish American or Italian American or German American. You know, that was really central to your identity. Today, who centrally identifies themselves as Irish, American, or Italian, Irish, Italian, or German Americans? Very few people, and they're quite old, right? Those ethnic identities kind of fade over time. You know, in the, actually, the longer that uh, Latino and Hispanic people, the longer their families are in America, the less likely they are to refer to themselves as Hispanic, Hispanic or Latino. Yeah. So I'm worrying now that we're getting to that kind of third, fourth, fifth generation in the Jewish community where you hear a lot of people saying, oh, yeah, I'm a cultural Jew. Oh, my, my dad's Jewish. I'm, you know, I'm Jewish by heritage. Um, that is, that's not a great space, I think, for Judaism to be in. We are not just a vague, quote, ethnic identity. Jews are every race and ethnicity, so it doesn't even make sense to conceive of it that way. But when people do, I think, number one, it's inaccurate. And number two, I just don't think that's sustainable. I think the assimilationist pull of America is so strong that without people really understanding the substance of the religion, the traditions, the culture, the wisdom, I think it's going to be hard to sustain. Yeah, and I think, you know, hearing you talk about this, um, I think that's a, a principle or a goal that really we as a society should should take on. I have many students who think, oh, I'm at university, I'm going to learn all I need to know, and then I'm done, right? <laughs> Just like you're talking about uh, young Jewish kids in, you know, at Hebrew school and preparing for their bar and bat mitzvahs. Um, but, uh, you know, and I, I'm like, no, 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 you're not getting it. I'm here 
to get you started right. <laughs> on, this, on this process, lifelong process of, of critical inquiry and learning and experiencing the world and embracing new experiences that surprise you and astound you and even upset you. Um, and so I think that, that, yeah, I think that's a really great answer for um, how Jewish communities can, you know, kind of embrace literacy, embrace ongoing and continued learning within the tradition. But I think we should do that as a society too. I feel totally like we agree. Should all the embracing literacy and, and, and learning. So that, that's a good lesson for all of us is what I'm trying to say. Um, now we have uh, a few questions have come in. Um, uh, just folks, bear with me as I get my my uh, Zoom windows. I actually, and I should say, you know, the Jewish community in in the U.S. is not the only community facing this challenge. You know, there was a report released in 2013 on the Jewish community, just kind of indicating, you know, like a greater level of disengagement and disconnection than we'd thought, and. I remember a, an imam I heard speak, he said that actually in the weeks after that report came out, he got calls from imams and Muslim leaders across America saying, oh my God, this is what's gonna happen to us. Like what's happening to the Jews is gonna happen to us too. How do we stop this? But again, so, you know, it is just, I think a lot of communities are kind of struggling with that assimilationist pull and how do they preserve their cultures, traditions, religions amidst that, and it's, it's not easy. Yeah, yes, yeah, for sure. Um, uh, yeah, that's a real challenge. Um, so uh, I will pivot to our questions from the audience here, and we have a few. Um, as a reminder, just again, uh, you can use that Q&A button to submit your question at any time. Um, this first one, um, uh, oh, uh, is from Stacy, and really just more of a comment. I think she just wanted to share that the Jewish Federation of Edmonton uh, is going to be hosting a Zoom menorah lighting for Hanukkah as a way to gather. So yeah, just uh, affirmation and, and uh, um, I guess another example of how communities are coming together virtually um, in these times. Um, and I know that's true for Christian churches. It's true um, for um, uh, Muslim communities. Um, folks are using Zoom. <laughs> it's a good time for Zoom. Um, so this so there's there's another question that came in from our our former dean uh, Alan Berger, um, and this is a tough one. Uh, I know, so I'll let you answer it however you like but he's curious about your um, position on Zionism and um, how you think Israel figures into American politics. Uh, and again, I know we've talked some, you and I, about the intractableness. I don't know what other word to use um, of this political problem in the Middle East, but um, he's curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, it's, you know, I think, you know, I am, I am a Zionist. I care deeply about the future of Israel. I think it has a right to exist. And I, I, you know, I believe in the two-state solution, which just, you know, it seems like it's been we're sort of something that we've been struggling with for so long, but I, I really do believe that, believe in it. Um, you know, I think something that is just really worrisome to me is just how divisive this issue has come, become in the Jewish community and in America in general, and also how partisan it's become. I think one of the strengths that we've always had in America is a really bipartisan support for Israel. And I, I think in the last three or four years, you know, I've watched Israel more and more become some a, a kind of associated with Trump and with, you know, right wing Christian evangelicals and things like that. And that's, that's not, you know, that's not good for, for the future of U.S. Israel relations. You know, this needs to be a bipartisan, broad coalition kind of issue. So that is, that is quite worrisome to me. Um, I also think, you know, just thinking about American Judaism, I think that one thing that frustrates me is that, you know, we don't put, we don't put Israel in the, its broader context. You know, Israel have, has, of course, always been central to Judaism and, and you know, such, a, such an important part of our, our history and hopefully our future as well. But, you know, I think that there's sometimes this message in the Jewish community that, like, Judaism equals Israel plus anti-Semitism. Like Judaism equals these issues that are, are most challenging and that are most kind of stressful and that we're just going to focus all of our energy on them. And that, that gives people a very distorted view of what Judaism is. Of course, those are two incredibly important issues. Israel's central to Judaism. 
anti-Semitism is rising and scary and deadly. And you know, anyone who thinks that's not an issue has been living under a rock. So I understand the emphasis on those issues, but you know, what about the other 4,000 years of Judaism? You know, read about our holidays and rituals, our ethics, our culture, our history, our languages, our music. I mean, we have so much to offer and I don't like seeing any, you know, such a vast extraordinary tradition kind of shrunk down to the small focus on one or two issues. So I, I really wish that this, that Israel were put in the broader context of Judaism and Jewish history and that we had a little bit more focus on the rest of Judaism as well. I think that you know, the rest of it is quite important. Jewish literacy is quite important. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't know if you're familiar with this name, but a few years ago at the center here, we hosted a scholar from Notre Dame named Atalia Omer who um, is an Israeli, she's an Israeli American, um, so grew up in Israel. Um, and uh, her most recent book is really fascinating. It, it's a kind of ethnography on kind of young um, movements within Judaism, but also um, amongst Arab Palestinians and how, you know, especially in North America, but also in the Middle East, how, how there are newer movements where folks are bonding in new and creative ways and kind of saying, you know what, the old peace movements, even the two-state solution advocates from a generation ago have just missed the boat and they're not getting us uh, in the direction we want to go in. So she's written this really great book where she spends time with different um, different um, movements uh, in North America and in Israel that are trying to push for change in the Middle East. So um, for those in the audience or, or for you as well, Sarah, uh, Atalia Omer's work, I think is really interesting how she's kind of um, documenting um, pushes for change in the Middle East. Um, uh, so another question has come in from, uh, from Joe Weeb, from my religion colleague here at Augustana. And he says that he really loves the description of being Jewish um, as being part of a peoplehood rather than as a racial or an ethnic identity of some sort. Um, so he would like to know if you could say a little bit more about what differentiates this concept of peoplehood. Um, can this be, he asks, can this be a religious resource for addressing and reframing racial injustice beyond Judaism? Yeah, you know, it is, it's, it is sort of complicated. It's a great question. And it's something that you know, I had to kind of really learn about and wrestle with and figure, try to figure out how to explain in my book. You know, basically the idea of a peoplehood, it's sort of almost a historic peoplehood that is, you know, membership is passed down kind of just through birth. Or if you adopt, you know, if you adopt a child and convert the child to Judaism or by choice, right? People who say, oh, I want to be part of this tradition. I want to be part of this this peoplehood, this family, you know, so that, you know, I kind of, I kind of love that about Judaism in that it's, it's open, right? Anyone who wants to be part of it, you know, you can come in, you can convert. And I also love that being Jewish, it's, you know, it, it has nothing to do with your race, with your ethnicity, right? People of any race, any ethnicity, they can be Jewish, right? They can join the peoplehood or they can be born into the peoplehood. So, you know, in terms of how how that concept applies to racial injustice, I, I'm not totally sure because it, it doesn't, you know, peoplehood does not have, it's not about race, right? So it, I, I'm not totally sure. I guess maybe one way of thinking about it is, you know, it's a peoplehood that embraces and equally welcomes people of all races, of all ethnicities, who are all there because they want to be part of the shared tradition, the shared story, the shared family. And I think that approach is pretty darn good. Right. I actually think it's sort of, it's a way of saying like, oh, you are, you know, either you've been born into this and decided to embrace it or not or whatever, or you've chosen to be part of it and you're on equal footing here, right? We're all, we're all the same. We're all Jews. You know, when someone converts to Judaism, you, there's no such thing as a con, you don't call them a convert. That, that doesn't make sense. They're a Jew, right? They're, there's a Jew, you know, mm -hmm. there's no distinction between them and not any other Jew. Um, you know, it's a good question. I think, you know, I, I think something I've been really excited about and, and just moved by is the extent to which I'm seeing the Jewish community in North America or you know, the vast majority of it really take on the issue of racial injustice, you know, both within the community and how do we better, you know, how are Jews of color welcomed and supported and, and considered, you know, really like considered part of the community because you do have the Jews of color in America who say, you know, people don't believe I'm Jewish or I go to a synagogue and people are like, oh, what are you doing here? Like, I'm here to pray, just like you are. Like, what? Or it's like, oh, or how are you Jewish? What do you mean, how am I Jewish? I'm, what? Like, these, 
you know, and it's because they're, because America, you know, American Judaism a hundred years ago, it was less diverse. It is now more diverse for a variety of reasons, you know, intermarriage, conversion, things like that. So, you know, I think this is, a, it's an issue that we, we as Jews are struggling with within our own community. And we're also struggling with it in the much broader, broader American community where, you know, we are just seeing the brutality of systemic racism and how it is, you know, it's pervasive in all of our institutions and we need to address it. And mm -hmm. it's going to be, a, you know, a long, it's going to be a, a big and long-term project. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's another excellent example of how a Jewish principle or, or something we can learn from Jewish tradition can apply broadly to us as a society in North America, but, um, the, you know, also to the concept of being an American or a Canadian, right? Mm -hmm. These kind of, these modern nation state concepts of peoplehood or, or nationhood um, could probably learn a lot from these, these um, Jewish principles you're discussing in relation to being a part of the Jewish people. Um, there's um, a question here, um, which we're, we're running short on time here, and this is maybe a good one to, to wrap it up with, actually, from a student um, last night. I'm not sure if the student's here again today, but we have a list of questions, too, that we couldn't get to last night, so uh, apologies to anyone that questions we didn't get to. Um, uh, oh, the student is here. I'm getting information from my behind-the-scenes folks. Perfect. Great. So this is uh, Semhar, and uh, the question was, um, how has your, your journey in Judaism helped you connect the dots in your life? Um, is there a particular theme um, in your life that has been enlightened or has been highlighted, perhaps, um, because of, of Judaism? Yeah, what a beautiful question. Thank you for that. Um, I think a couple of things. Um, I think first and foremost, Judaism has really driven home for me my obligations to others. You know, the sense that I am I am not an individual atom just floating about my business, right? That that I have very real obligations to other people, you know, to care for them, to be concerned for them, to be sensitive to them. And I think this is so deeply reflected in Jewish law. You know, I as I said last night, you know, there's this old lie that Christianity is a religion of love and Judaism is a religion of law. And that's, that's not true. Right? Our Jewish laws, they reflect our, our caring, our concern, our compassion. And there's just one little one that I, I often think of that kind of moves me, which is about how, you know, if in, it's obviously quite old fashioned, it's an old law, but if you go into a store, you are not allowed to ask the shopkeeper for the price of, about what the price of an item is, if you have zero intention whatsoever of buying it. If you absolutely know I'm never going to buy this item, you should not ask the shopkeeper for the price of it. You should not take up the shopkeeper's time. And, you know, this seems oddly specific. Like, really? You had to legislate that? But I, I actually find it quite moving because what it is saying is this person is trying to make a living and you do not have a right to get their hopes up unfairly or to use them as an object for your entertainment, right? That That's actually not appropriate. And that just, it's just, an, it's one of many, many examples of this exquisite sensitivity to the dignity and the humanity of others. So I think that kind of hyper-specificity of Jewish law, that, that constant call to see others in their full humanity, to really think about how they might be feeling, to think about how, you know, the impact of my actions on their lives, you know, I think that's really shaped my, my sensibility. I think also just this notion that we're all created in the divine image, um, you know, it is it is really pushed me to, to to try to embrace the idea that like you know we're each here for a reason that there actually is a spark of the divine within each of us and I think I, I kind of feel called to try to discern what that is and you know you can you can speak about this in secular terms as well right you can say you know what is my my truest self what is my purpose when do I feel like I'm really doing what I should be doing in the world perfectly that is that is how I would express it in a secular sense. In a religious sense, I would say, like, what is my divine spark, right? What am I being called to do by, you know, you know, in, in a sort of bigger way? And that's something that I've just really, in recent years, tried to be much more sensitive to and attuned to. You know, I'm very, very easily influenced by what other people think is impressive or, like, what will get the gold star or the line on the resume. You know, I'm a total company kid. I check many resume boxes, and that that's sort of, like, the safe space for me. But... You know, I'm really trying to actually in recent years pay attention to like what is actually truly important to me what truly makes me makes my heart 
jump? Like what, what, where do I really feel called to be as opposed to like what is impressive or safe or looks good to others? And obviously that's something that I can do from a position of tremendous privilege, right? I am, I am not, you know, I, I'm not struggling to pay my bills. I am not, you know, dealing with an illness. I am not caretaking people for people in my family. So I, I really want to acknowledge that's, that's really a very privileged thing to be able to do. But I do think that all of us in our own lives, no matter, you know, even if your circumstances right now are really difficult and you've just got to do what you've got to do to survive, you can still in the back of your mind kind of just ask yourself, like, okay, you know, assuming I can get through this at some point, where, where do I want to be? What do I feel called to do in the world? How can I have an impact on other people? Um, I think that's something that Judaism has really pushed me to think more, more deeply about. Hmm. That's a really beautiful uh, closing comment, I think. Uh, so we'll just end there. And I, I want to thank you so much for sharing with us these last uh, couple of days, today and yesterday. Um, thank you for your book. Um, thank you for writing that book. And uh, although I would love to read the book about, about your writing career and more about time with the Obamas and stuff. I think that, uh, as I said last night, and I'll say again today, your book is, is a, a, a really commendable um, contribution to understanding Judaism and a very personal book as well. So thank you for writing that and, and for sharing some, some more behind the scenes kind of stuff with us today and yesterday. Um, these Zoom goodbyes are always weird and awkward, uh, uh, but um, we'll say goodbye now and we'll catch yes. up uh, soon. Um, but thanks so much. Uh, Sarah, and um, I hope that you have a great weekend. Happy Friday. Thank you. You too. Thank you so much for having me and for being such a wonderful conversation partner. This has really been great. Yeah. I thanks. hope everyone has a great weekend. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I will, um, I want to one more time here uh, share my, well, let's see. Again, my Zoom skills are failing me here. Share my screen. Um, I want to. Uh, Remind you all again to please follow us on social media. Please um, enroll in our email list. And also many thanks. I forgot, I uh, very uh, sorry to say that I forgot to thank the Lockheed Performing Arts Center. Um, they have been providing behind the scenes logistics support with our Zoom and with our planning. So many thanks to Sean at the Lougheed Center, um, who has helped us um, both last night and tonight and with previous Ronning Center events this semester. Um, we could not do the techie stuff uh, without them. So thanks so much, Sean. Um, also, thanks again, Kim, uh, for um, your work, your hard work to make all this happen as well. And thank you all to everyone who came today and for your great support of the Chester Ronning Center. Um, we will see you all again soon. Thanks so much. Have a great weekend. Bye.